Well, hello, writing scholars. It's time to talk about our subject matter this quarter, urban legends, conspiracy theories, and hoaxes. So let's take a look at what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at the informational space that we live in, and that includes our oral culture, things like conversation, word of mouth, rumors, and innuendo, stories, jokes, gossip, also the news and social media that we encounter on the internet, various educational content, including what we're doing right here in our own class, historical archives, chronicles, and legends, folklore, and myths. We, it's very useful, I think, to recall again here at the onset that research writing is as much or more process than it is product or thing. Writing is a process. We're going to talk about that again and again. It's also useful at this point to make a quick academic pit stop. I'll reference here Wardle and Down's work from 2007 in the Journal of College Composition and Communication, their work teaching about writing, writing misconceptions, which has been cited about 95 times by what looks like a who's who of writing study disciplinarians. Here are four points to bear in mind as we proceed forward. The writer's enhanced self-awareness of how they personally process information is really at stake here in our studies. And this concerns the executive brain functions of thinking about thought itself and keeping control over what we let into our minds and how we think about it, what we commonly nowadays call mindfulness. Also, getting research confidence by knowing what you know and acknowledging what you don't know, and as I like to say, how many decimal places you don't know it. Looking at reading closely rather than just merely familiarizing ourselves with words. We're going to look at critical thinking and reading as a critical thinking process in terms of pausing, digesting what we've read, and annotating as we go. And finally, research writing as researching the world. And again, knowledge is a dynamic, not a static thing. I would like to briefly insert a quote here from Robert Maynard Hutchins, who's one of my educational idols from my youth. Uh, he says this about writing. He says, what binds authors together in an intellectual community is the great conversation in which they're engaged. In the works that come later in the sequence of years, we find authors listening to what their predecessors have had to say about this idea or that, this topic or that. They not only hearken to the thought of their predecessors, they also respond to it by commenting on it in a variety of ways. And that's what we're gonna do this quarter in our writing. I wanna also begin with a quick cautionary warning about our subject matter. Uh, anything can offend some people, but this quarter we're going to be encountering some subject matter, which is almost automatically guaranteed to give offense to someone sometime. Uh, you'll find some things that are absolutely infuriating and maddening. And if these sorts of things are off-putting or disturbing to you, and you find them too difficult to plow through, this might be a good time to take a different writing class than what we're going to be doing in here. Let's start with urban legends. So urban legends are typically conveyed via word-of-mouth conversations and correspondence. They're the kinds of things we like to talk about around campfires or when we're together with our friends. They're almost always difficult or impossible to verify. And they usually are preceded by some sort of a preamble like, a friend of my friend told me about this, or you won't believe what I just heard. Also, urban legends frequently overlap with folklore, rumor, innuendo, mythology. We're going to see these areas of study intersect again and again. Most urban legends are characterized by a friend of a friend or FOF quality. The testimony can't be verified or corroborated with evidence readily. And oftentimes the stories that are shared confer some form of social prestige. You'll often hear people say when telling you an urban legend, well, not many people know about this, but, or I just heard something that you haven't heard about. A few examples of urban legends include abductions of humans by space aliens, and their unusual UFOs, razor blades and Halloween candy, 
and what's called cryptozoology, or hidden creatures, if you will, such as Bigfoot or Sasquatch, the Loch Ness Monster, and mermaids. Also specific stories like the Vanishing Hitchhiker, which, as we'll learn, has roots that stretch all the way back to the ancient world, and more contemporary examples, such as purported stories of dead rats and severed fingers and fast food french fries. As we'll find out, urban legends often impart a moral claim or a lesson, a sort of parable, if you will. Many of them are outright warnings, but most of the time they're told purely for their entertainment value. They also give agency to random and especially threatening events. It's far easier to accept a story for the reason of nature's fury than it is to consider that it's purely a random act that could occur to anybody. Also, most urban legends confirm or prove some kind of pre-existing belief. They tell us what we want to hear because we already believe it. And urban legends frequently are imbued with mimetic qualities. They just beg to be retold again and again, shared across the internet, and recur all throughout our culture. A useful working definition for Merriam-Webster is an often lurid story or an anecdote that's based on hearsay and widely circulated as true. Now let's move to conspiracy theories. Another working definition from Webster, a theory that explains an event or a set of circumstances as the result of a secret plot by usually powerful conspirators. But we also want to distinguish between conspiracy theories and conspiracy narratives. Michael Shermer gives us a useful scholarly definition. Conspiracy theories connect the dots of random events into meaningful patterns and then infuse those patterns with intentional agency. Add to those propensities the confirmation bias, which seeks and finds confirmatory evidence for what we already believe, and the hindsight bias, which tailors after-the-fact explanations to what we already know happened, and we have the foundation for conspiratorial cognition. It'll be useful to our study as we engage in research writing about these topics, particularly conspiracy theories, to separate our terms. Conspiracy theory is a convenient label that we use to talk about them, and that's all well and good, but we also want to understand that there are real conspiracies that have been firmly documented in the historical record. These we'll refer to as conspiracy narratives, which may still be subject to examination, but some of them have been confirmed. For example, here in the American political landscape, we have the all too familiar Watergate scandal of the early 1970s, the Teapot Dome scandal of the early 1920s, various stories that recur again and again of music industry payola schemes starting from the 1950s on, and official corruption by government officials around the globe. Also various forms of investor fraud, such as pump and dump stock schemes and pyramid schemes. Here's a rhetorical question for you. Is a surprise birthday party a conspiracy? Well, think about it. You have a group of people colluding in secret to spring a surprise on the unwitting birthday victim. But is this really a conspiracy? Well, one of the characteristics of true conspiracy is that they usually have a sinister malevolent intent and outcome. They're intended to injure, kill, steal, control, enslave, and such, and they often represent an attempt to consolidate power by already powerful interest. They're almost always attended by disinformation and subterfuge to surprise and deceive others. Conspiracy theories share a few characteristics in common with urban legends. Remember, these subjects often overlap. For example, they're frequently conveyed via friend-of-a-friend testimony, and they're highly mimetic, they just beg to be retold via the internet, social media, and word of mouth conversation. Conspiracy theories are also frequently attended by punditry and demagoguery, something that we'll examine in closer detail later. And they're very reliant upon confirmation and hindsight biases. Examples of conspiracy theories you may have heard of are claims that, for example, JFK was assassinated by the CIA, or 
the 9-11 attacks were planned and carried out by Israel's Mossad. Or, NASA moon landings were all faked. Or, a very old one, that fluoride is added to drinking water not for your teeth, but to control your mind. It's also convenient to notice that most conspiracy theories consist of some kind of super narrative, which is typically an older, more underlying narrative, subtended by various sub-narratives. For example, we might hear someone claim that the Illuminati, whatever that is, control the world. They are assisted by the Trilateral Commission, the United Nations, the Freemasons, and the Bilderberger elite. They frequently rely on confirmation bias and hindsight bias to convince non-believers and to grandize control over those who are already believing them. And they frequently rely on burden of proof or argument from ignorance claims. For example, someone might say, well, you can't convince me it's not true, as if lack of proof is proof enough. And then we move to hoaxes. Another helpful working definition from Merriam-Webster is that a hoax is an act intended to trick or dupe, or similarly, something accepted or established by fraud or fabrication. These are closely related to disinformation, propaganda, and so-called active measures, which we'll learn about later, not misinformation and honest mistakes. Hoaxes often have a mischievous or malevolent intent. They're not simple mistaken beliefs due to error in perception or judgment. There are two sorts, the mischievous kinds of hoaxes, which consist mainly of practical jokes or farce intended to entertain, kid, or embarrass people, and those that are more malevolent, which are deceits intended to injure or steal from someone. Examples of hoaxes include Piltdown Man, the Cardiff Giant, Orson Welles' infamous broadcast on the radio of War of the Worlds in 1939, the Enron Corporation's manipulation of the electrical grid in order to drive prices, and intentionally built crop circles, well, or, well, we'll look at that one later. Here are our course objectives this quarter. Again, we're not trying to decide whether any urban legend, conspiracy narrative, or hoax is really true or really false. What we're going to do in our writing research is focus on the genesis and sources of this material, its propagation and spread via various media, their historical backgrounds, cultural impacts, cognitive science, and psychology of human beings, and how all this fits together. We're going to exercise our research writing skills by working with neutralized subject matter in the form of urban legends, conspiracy theories, and hoaxes. If you have any questions at all about the subject matter or this course in general, please contact me via email, text, or phone, which is provided on our course website. I look forward to seeing your explorations in this subject matter.